Right. So know the parts here. So like respiratory zone versus conducting zone. So for for instance, you know, conducting zone will be nasal cavity, pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles. And then for respiratory zone, it will be respiratory bronchial um, alveolar duct and alveolar line. Please know these terms. Okay, so if I ask you about the process of internal respiration and you want to clarify what it is, I'm not going to help you out on that. So internal respiration is the gas exchange in the tissues, external in the lungs, pulmonary ventilation, movement of air in and out of the lungs. And gas transport is carried out by the blood. So anatomy here, the roof of nasal cavity, the ethmoid bone and the frontal bone, um, nasal bone, nose and tenaris is divided by the septum, uh, the floor of nasal cavity is maxillary bone. Um, that's basically like the anatomy questions here. Uh, main functions warm and humidify the air, uh, resonate, um, reclaim heat and um, water when you exhale. Sensory well smell. Um, please know the different epithelia types. So a nasal cavity, pseudostratified ciliated, function of cilia is to move mucus. Uh, nasal, main components of nasal secretions, immunoglobulin, mucin, lysozyme, water. Uh, Concha and miati, they function is to increase the surface area, to improve the reclamation of the heat and or um, water vapors. Paranasal sinuses, know them. So we've got two maxillary, two frontal, sphenoidal, and ethmoid sinuses. Rhinitis inflammation of the uh, nasal cavity, sinusitis inflammation of the sinuses. Parts of pharynx. So we've got nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx. Oropharynx, um, nasopharynx is involved exclusively in respiration. Epithelium, um, nasopharynx, pseudostratified ciliated, oropharynx and laryngopharynx, um, stratified squamous. Because those parts of the pharynx are involved in deglutition, the digestive process, and in order to prevent the excessive abrasion forces, um, we've got stratified squamous epithelium in those two parts. Larynx starts where the laryngopharynx ends, it opens into the trachea. The functions of larynx is to separate the air from the food and vice versa, so the food does not get into the respiratory system. And also to produce vocal sounds, not the speech, but the vocal sounds. That's the organ that produces the vocal sounds. The type of epithelium that covers the portions of the larynx. Superior portion is stratified squamous, inferior portion is pseudostratified ciliated epithelium. Thyroid cartilage forms Adam's apple. Function of epiglottis. Elastic cartilage that closes uh, larynx when somebody is swallowing food, so food doesn't get into the respiratory cavity. Vocal vestibular folds. Vocal folds actually produce the sound. Vestibular folds, um, they do not. They open and close the glottis. We make sound by expelling the air, and that expulsion of air vibrates the vocal folds. Sound pitch is determined by the length and tension of the vocal folds, and sound loudness is determined by the strength of exhalation. Um, they resonate. Basically, these structures resonate. In the Zalva's maneuver,
it's the when you close the glottis and then um, increase the pressure in your lungs which increases the pressure in your thoracic and abdominal cavity and anyone was no chat okay I'm just if you have a question and don't want to unmute yourself you can write in the chat okay I'll see that um, what I was talking about yeah and pressure in the thoracic and abdominal cavity goes up and it stabilizes the trunk um, so larynx and bronchi are connected by trachea layers of tracheal wall remember there there's no muscularis there's mucosa there's submucosa there's adventitia but no muscularis mucosa is stratified pseudostrat sorry pseudostratified ciliated trachealis muscle allows you to expel mucus when it contracts you cough Trachea branches into the primary bronchi. Primary bronchi direct the air into the lungs, right and left lung. Lobar bronchi direct the air towards the pulmonary lobes and segmental to the bronchopulmonary segments. The bronchioles are smaller uh, branches of bronchi. And conducting zone ends with the terminal bronchiole and starts with the respiratory bronchiole. Structural changes that occur so um, connective tissue replaces the cartilage and the amount of smooth muscle increases structures of the respiratory zone respiratory bronchial alveolar duct and alveoli alveoli are sort of tiny little bubbles organized into alveolar sacs and external respiration happens in alveoli We're good kind of weird just sound never mind um, structures that form respiratory membrane it's the uh, alveolar epithelium mostly simple squamous uh, epithelium of the pulmonary capillaries simple squamous and a thin basement membrane that separates them it should be thin to facilitate more efficient uh, gas transport across the respiratory membrane so type of epithelium that comprises alveolar walls Type 1 alveolar cells are simple squamous. Type 2 are simple cuboidal cells, and they produce surfactant. Alveolar pores equilibrate the pressures in different across the across the lung in different alveoli. Alveolar macrophages destroy the pathogens and you know debris that land in the alveoli. Stroma of the lungs is a connective tissue that provides sort of a structural framework. The costal surface of the lung is the surface that faces the, the ribs. At the hilum, um, bronchi, pulmonary arteries and veins, and nerves enter the lung at the hilum. Uh, right lung is bigger and it has three lobes. Left lung is small and has two lobes. And fissures divide the lung into the lobes. Bronchopulmonary segments are the smallest <coughs> lung um, partitions that can be surgically removed in the disease. Uh, difference with pulmonary circulation. So remember, in pulmonary circulation, pulmonary arteries, they take blood to the alveoli, where blood gets oxygenated in pulmonary veins, bring the blood back into the heart. Bronchial circulation is uh, the bronchial arteries supply the blood to the tissue of the lungs. It's a part of the systemic circuit. And bronchial veins uh, drain into the pulmonary veins. Parietal pleura lines the walls of the pleural cavity, and visceral pleura lines the lungs. Space between the parietal and the visceral pleura is pleural cavity. The, the fluid fills that cavity. Now, um, so inspiration, expiration. You have a, a question on, I hope everybody saw the practice exam. It's there, so it kind of gives you a pretty good idea of types of questions that I'm going to ask in the main exam. <clears throat> 
So essentially, when you inspire, what, so first of all, let's let's describe a couple of pressures. So intrapulmonary pressure, pressure in the alveoli, we can call it pressure inside the lung. Intrapleural pressure, pressure in the pleural cavity. Intrapleural pressure is always smaller than intrapulmonary. That what makes your lung inflated, maintains it inflated. So positive respiratory pressure is when intrapulmonary pressure is higher than atmospheric. Negative respiratory pressure in then is then when intrapulmonary pressure is lower. And zero respiratory pressure is when intrapulmonary and atmospheric pressures are equal. So when you inspire, when you inspire, your chest expands the intrapulmonary and intrapleural pressures both drop, go down. So since the pressure in your lungs becomes lower than the atmospheric pressure, the air moves into the lungs. That's inspiration. At the top of inspiration, the pressure inside of the lungs is equal to the atmospheric pressure. Then when you expire, Remember, inspiration is active process, so diaphragm contracts and intercostal muscles contract. When you expire, that's passive process. All muscles need to do is to relax. So when they relax, the volume of the thoracic cage and the volume of the lungs decreases. Intrapulmonary pressure goes up, becomes higher than atmospheric, and the air goes from higher intrapulmonary towards lower atmospheric pressure. Remember, air will always go from higher pressure to the lower pressure. Um, okay, what happens to a lung if the fluid accumulates in the pleural cavity? The fluid accumulates in the pleural cavity, the pressure in the pleural cavity increases and lung collapses. So in normal conditions, transpulmonary pressure is always negative. And it's negative and it's function to maintain lung expanded. The more negative transpulmonary pressure is, the more inflated the lung is. So what is atelectasis? It's the condition in which your respiratory passages are obstructed, maybe caused by, say, abnormal accumulation of mucus. And in this case, since they are obstructed and there, there is no normal airflow into the lungs, pressure in the lungs decreases. When it decreases, it becomes equal to the intrapleural pressure. Your transpulmonary pressure becomes zero, and at zero transpulmonary pressure, lungs collapse. So in atelectasis, intrapulmonary equals intrapleural, um, and that leads to the collapse of the lung. Pneumothorax is when you have a patent wound. Patent means penetrating wound in the thoracic cage, which creates a passage between the air, atmospheric air, and pleural cavity. Atmospheric air gets into the pleural cavity. Atmospheric air gets into the pleural cavity. And your intrapleural pressure so, in pneumothorax, intrapleural becomes equal to intrapulmonary pressure, and that causes the lung collapse. And it can be treated by inserting the needle and sucking the air out of the pulmonary cavity. Um, what happens to the Dr. pressure? K. Yes. So, if you ask that question Dr. on the exam, you're looking for all the So, if you ask that question on the Exam, uh, you're looking for all the information. Not really. <laughs> Not really. You understand I'm what sorry. I'm saying? You have to, that's, I will specify. So, uh, so okay. Um, I don't um, remember the exact wording of the practice question, but for atelectasis on the practice exam, I think I have a. Do you have practice exam next to you? Um, yeah, I'm looking at mine right now. Say it again? Um, yeah, I'm looking at mine right now. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. 
Okay, so can you remind me what is the right wording now. of the atelectasis question in the practice exam? Explain what happens in atelectasis. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Explain hold on. what happens in First, atelectasis. What happens in atelectasis. What? You're telling me at atelectasis, the respiratory passages are obstructed, for example, by the accumulation of mucus. Got it? Next sentence in the question. Right. Read it. Demonstrate what pressures right. will change and what will happen. Demonstrate to the lungs. what pressures so, will change and what will happen. What we say is to the okay. In atelectasis, intrapulmonary pressure will decrease. It will become equal to intrapleural, which will lead to the lung collapse. That's it. That's it. Does that make sense? So, sense, yeah. but in this one, like in the, in the, it makes sense, I yeah. call it, in pneumothorax, you see pneumothorax is when thoracic cage is poked through and atmospheric air can get into the pleural cavity, which makes intrapleural pressure equal to intrapulmonary. I mean, if you say that it becomes equal to atmospheric and therefore equal to intrapulmonary, it's fine too. But the point is, intrapleural pressure becomes equal to intrapulmonary. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. And when they are equal, okay. one collapses because transpulmonary yeah. pressure becomes zero. Okay. Did I answer your question? So, yes, sir. like... Okay. If you tell me that in pneumothorax lung collapses without yes, any explanation, I, I I will make sure that I ask in the details. Does that make sense? Like I tell you, please answer this, this, and this. If you answer those questions, you're fine. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, pressure okay. in the lungs, so when it, its you. volume increases, the pressure in the lung goes down. When its volume decreases, the pressure in the lung goes up. During inspiration, diaphragm intercostal muscles contract. Thoracic volume increases. Um, lung pressure becomes lower than atmospheric, so the air flow into the lungs. Transpulmonary, intrapulmonary, they decrease. Uh, intrapleural pressure becomes a little bit more negative and then goes back to zero. Uh, diaphragm intercostal muscles during expiration, opposite. So diaphragm intercostal muscles relax, volume of the thorax decreases, pressure in the lung increases, air flows out of the lungs, transpulmonary pressure uh, goes up a little bit and then down to, to to its normal level. Intrapulmonary slightly increases. Intrapleural slightly increases. Uh, how does air flow depend on the pressure gradient? Okay, so uh, the higher the gradient, the higher the flow. Resistance, the higher the resistance, the lower the flow. We learned it in cardiovascular. Airway resistance is not particularly significant because it's air and because there's mucus and there's really not a lot of um, friction so the medium-sized bronchi demonstrate the highest resistance in terminal bronchioles the resistance is minimal because air starts to diffuse through the walls of the bronchioles surfactant it reduces the surface tension it's produced by type 2 alveolar cells it consists of water and mostly proteins. So when alveoli inflate surface tension, they inflate surface tension increases, and when they deflate surface tension decreases. So if surfactant production is abnormally low, surface tension goes up, it becomes first of all harder to inflate the alveoli, and they collapse much faster. So basically in those premature babies, lungs collapse very, not lung, alveoli collapse uh, very quickly because surface tension is so high. Um, lung compliance, ability of a lung to 
expand in response to a certain change in the pressure. So basically, the higher the compliance, the easier the lung expands. If you want sort of a rough analogy, if you will compare a, a balloon and a bicycle tire, the balloon has really high compliance. You pump a little bit of air, it expands. The tire has low compliance. You pump a little bit of air and nothing happens. So what can reduce lung compliance? Um, sorry, brain fart. What can reduce lung compliance? Things like pulmonary fibrosis. Any kind of a damage to the actual stroma of the lungs that makes lungs less elastic. So essentially, lungs with a high compliance, they are easier to inflate in lungs with a low compliance, they are easier to deflate. Now, volumes. I In the video, I review them in very much details. I, I don't think that's just memorization. Now, you can forget about forced expiratory. I'm not going to ask this. And capacities, you can forget about forced vital capacity. Okay? Don't, don't, don't worry about it. But this four, like this eight, you need to know. And I think there is a... Uh, Billy, whoever has the... Uh, wh you have the practice exam. There is a question about the capacities. Can you read it out loud? On the practice. The question about the, capa the, the volumes and capacities. And there's a question about. Um, describe two respiratory volumes um, mm -hmm. that can be expired. Describe two inspired. respiratory inspired? volumes. Okay, yes. okay, okay. That can be expired. And at the very end, what, I, what do I ask at the yes. very end? Of that and question. Hypothesize how restricted lung disease and may affect these volumes. volumes. Yeah, so, how so restricted basically this is something that I volumes. want you to... Wait a minute, what, what just happened? Sorry, um, for some reason this thing just closed on me. So I will have to open it again. Uh, okay, it doesn't, doesn't affect, we're still recording, everything's fine. So what you have to be able to say, so think of it this way. Restrictive lung disease versus obstructive lung disease. So restrictive disease is the one that in which lung compliance is lower. So lung becomes fibrotic, okay? It's hard to stretch it, there's too much connective tissue, not connective. Obstructive disease, the lung volume is fine, but the, the diameter of the pass, the, the, the resistance to flow is too high. So if you think about it, if you, in, in the, in the um, practice exam, the question refers to the um, uh, volumes that we can inspire. So we can inspire a tidal volume Okay, we can inspire tidal volume and we can inspire inspiratory reserve volume. And if you have a restrictive disease, then that inspiratory reserve volume will be all the inspiratory volumes will go down. Basically, your lung effectively is not as stretchable, so you cannot inspire as much as you used to. Does that make sense? Billy, you're on the phone, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah, it makes sense. So think of it this way. You have you have two, like, normal lung is stretchable, so you can inhale a lot. That makes sense? But yeah, it makes sense. But fibrotic lung, lung with a restrictive disease, isn't stretchable, so you can't inspire as much. Got it? Yeah. So be able to kind of play with it a little bit. And I think I explain it in one of the videos.
Okay, uh, yep. forced vital, I mentioned, no. So, again, obstructive disease, obstruction of the conducting zone, restrictive disease is uh, loss of elasticity. Um, not the right question, so uh, forced vital, forget it. But be able to maneuver, like, for instance, in... Um, your in the um, obstructive disease so the residual the residual volume will increase because you just can't exhale all that air because your respiratory passages are clogged minute ventilation amount of air that is inhaled and exhaled in one minute you calculate it by multiplying breathing rate by the volume tidal volume it does not represent the amount of air that reaches alveol i'm going to close the chat Um, alveolar ventilation rate, the amount of air that reaches alveoli. So it's basically breathing rate multiplied by tidal volume minus minus dead space. Okay. So remember we talked about dead space, the volume of air that does not participate in gas exchange. There you go. Which type of breathing, deep and slow, will deliver higher alveolar ventilation, non-respiratory air movement? Just be aware of those, like coughing, sneezing, all those crying. Um, the Dalton Law, the concentration of gas in the fluid is, oh, uh, sorry, no, no, no. The pressure of the mix mixture of the gases is... Um, a sum of partial pressures of the gases. Henry's law, uh, the concentration of a particular gas in the, in the liquid is proportional to that gas's pressure above the liquid. Uh, gases become more soluble as the temperature goes down. Now, I'm gonna, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about this a little bit. And then I'm going to ask if you have any questions, and you will have a chance to kind of interact with me and ask me questions. So think of it this way. We have a certain composition, and I'm not asking any numbers on this. Okay, so so I think on um, like the only number game that you may be required to play is this one. Okay, so you need to know that equation. Now, in regards to this question, so you have certain ratios of gases in the atmosphere. What changes in the lungs? Well, if you think about it, in the lungs you have more CO2 and more water. So partial pressures of carbon dioxide and water vapors in the lungs are higher than in the atmosphere. And since it's a zero-sum game, so you take, you increase some, you have to decrease others, the partial pressures of oxygen and nitrogen in the lungs actually go down. Uh, before we move on, any questions? Anyone? No? Good? Okay. So structural features of respiratory membrane, two parameters, thickness, and the surface area. So thickness, it's very thin. It's a very thin membrane. And surface area is huge because alveoli, just huge surface area. So pathological conditions that can affect these two parameters. Fluid in the lungs makes the respiratory membrane thicker and the gas exchange suffers. This is what we see in patients with SARS-CoV-2. They have inflammation of the respiratory membrane, fluid accumulates in the lungs, that reduces the gas exchange in the lungs. Emphysema basically destroys the alveoli, which reduces the total surface area, which reduces the efficiency of the gas exchange. Okay. So, 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 this one. <coughs> um, 
do you need to know the numbers? Will I ask you what is a partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli, like in millimeters of mercury? The answer is no. Although it's one of four, but the answer is I will not ask this. So what you need to appreciate, and I'm going to use just one example. So let's say we are talking about the external respiration. So in external respiration, oxygen goes from alveoli into the blood in the pulmonary capillaries. Because oxygen pressure in the alveoli is higher than oxygen partial pressure in the blood. And carbon dioxide goes from the blood and the pulmonary capillaries into the alveoli to be exhaled because partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood and the pulmonary capillaries is higher than in the alveoli. And then you can go on and talk about, you know, systemic capillaries, blah, 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 and direction. I really emphasize here that if you tell me the direction of gas movement, you have to include the explanation why. And the explanation is because gases diffuse from high pressure to low pressure. <clears throat> Ventilation, perfusion, coupling. Um, if a certain alveolus has higher oxygen concentration, the blood flow to that alveolus will increase. Blood vessels will dilate. And they will take away oxygen, obviously, and will reduce the oxygen pressure in that alveolus. If the amount of CO2 in alveolus goes up, then bronchioles that lead to that alveolus will dilate, that will increase ventilation, and CO2 will be taken away. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Any questions before um, we go into the oxygen transport? I'm going to check the chat. Okay, nothing. Okay, let's move on. Uh, oxygen in the blood, mostly carried by hemoglobin. Four, saturation, four molecules, four oxygens per hemoglobin is 100%, three oxygens per hemoglobin is 75, so on and so forth. Oxyhemoglobin you can find <coughs> in the blood that is moving uh, from the lungs to the heart and then into the systemic circuit. And deoxyhemoglobin in the blood that is returned from the systemic circuit. Corporative binding, every subsequent molecule of oxygen binds easier than the previous one. Hemoglobin dissociation curve reflects the... Um, dependence of hemoglobin saturation on the oxygen partial pressure. So when oxygen partial pressure is high, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and so what I'm referring to here is this. When the oxygen partial pressure is high, this point, if you decrease the oxygen partial pressure. When you decrease the amount of oxygen, the saturation of hemoglobin does not change dramatically. If we're moving too low, like here, and you decrease um, partial pressure of oxygen, then hemoglobin saturation drops precipitously. Okay. And I was reviewing it on the video. I won't be able to do it with the same quality now. But basically the idea is that hemoglobin is practically 100% saturated in the lungs. And when it gets into the tissue, its saturation drops from 100% to 75%. So only one quarter of hemoglobin bound oxygen is actually unloaded during the normal resting state. And the rest of oxygen that is bound to hemoglobin, the rest 75% saturation of hemoglobin represents the venous reserve. And that's important if for some reason person stops breathing, that venous reserve will carry 
uh, the oxygen requirements of the brain for another couple of minutes. Does deep breathing increase hemoglobin saturation? No, the answer is no, because if you are healthy and you are in this point of the curve right here, even if you breathe deeper, you're not going to bring saturation any higher because it's practically 100% saturated. And same is true when somebody travels into the areas with a high altitude. <clears throat> so hemoglobin saturation decreases, but not by much, even though oxygen concentration in the air decreases significantly. So <clears throat> when we exercise, our tissues becomes very much deprived of hemoglobin, and hemoglobin unloading in tissues increases. So that how it helps to deliver more oxygen to the tissues. <clears throat> so higher temperature, elevated CO2, decreased pH, decreased oxygen, that all increases unloading of oxygen from hemoglobin. So basically, if you want to summarize what will increase the oxygen unloading, it will be elevated CO2, elevated temperature, lower pH, and lower oxygen. Now, these parameters are characteristic for metabolically active tissues. And if you move on to the lungs, all these parameters that I showed here, all these parameters, the direction directions of the arrows will basically flip. Because lungs, they have relatively low concentration of CO2, relatively lower temperature, relatively higher pH, and high oxygen content. Hypoxia, anemic, not enough red blood cells, ischemic, not enough blood flow, he's a toxic, poisons that inhibit, for instance, cellular respiration, hypoxemic, not enough oxygen in the air. Carbon monoxide binds to the oxygen in hemoglobin and basically causes hypoxemic um, hypoxia because it binds to hemoglobin very very strong much stronger than the oxygen and prevents oxygen from binding so basically you have iron and it can be either oxygen or carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide this bond is much stronger so it will be bound preferentially any questions so far? We're good? I'm giving you a few seconds. Okay. <clears throat> so carbon dioxide transported uh, three main ways. One, it's simply dissolved in the blood. Two, it binds to hemoglobin and it binds to the protein part of hemoglobin forming carbaminohemoglobin. Or it can be um, transported in the form of bicarbonate when it interacts with water it forms carbonic acid which dissociates to the hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. So this reaction is slow in the plasma because there is no enzyme that facilitates this reaction. While in the red blood cell there is an enzyme that facilitates the carbonic acid formation. So carbonic acid dissociates bicarbonate that is produced in red blood cells diffuses into the plasma and in the plasma it forms bicarbonate buffer. In red blood cells, hydrogen ion binds to hemoglobin, in plasma it binds to albumin. And when hydrogen binds to hemoglobin, hemoglobin changes its conformation, it changes its shape, 
and that shape change increases oxygen unloading. Um, in the pulmonary capillaries, everything goes backwards. So hydrogen ion and bicarbonate, they uh, recombine forming carbonic acid and carbonic acid dissociates into the water and CO2 and CO2 is exhaled. In the pulmonary capillaries, hydrogen ion unbinds from hemoglobin and that's it. Now bicarbonate buffer system when blood pH decreases it means more hydrogen ions. So in this case they bind to bicarbonate producing carbonic acid which then dissociates into water and CO2. When blood pH increases carbonic acid dissociates more carbonic acid dissociates into the hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. Hyperventilation, hyperventilation. So that sometimes is, is kind of a harder question. So hyper and hyperventilation are the um, conditions in which you either breathe too hard, much harder than you need, or you're not breathing hard enough. So uh, I can give you a couple of examples. It's really fascinating. So first, hyperventilation. Um, you start breathing really, really fast. You exhale a lot of carbon dioxide. Okay? When your blood loses carbon dioxide, the pH in hyperventilation, the pH will go up. Okay? So, when do you hyperventilate? You hyperventilate when you're stressed, right? When you're like really, really stressed, you start breathing really hard. What is the treatment? Give somebody a brown bag. So the person breathes in the bag. When person exhales CO2 in the bag and breathes in the bag, the person exhales CO2 and inhales it back, exhales and inhales it back. So that maintains normal pH of the blood and it prevents person from passing out. In hypoventilation, again, I'm going to uh, invoke our uh, coronavirus example. Patients with the respiratory failure patients that have that massive viral pneumonia, they hyperventilate essentially. They can't breathe normally. So CO2 starts to accumulate in the lungs and that leads to acidosis, so-called respiratory acidosis, which may eventually lead to the renal failure and even coma. Now, physiological changes that trigger increased or decreased ventilation rate. So if pH is low, respiratory rate will go up. If pH is high, the respiratory rate will go down. Now, ventral respiratory group sets normal breathing rate. Dorsal respiratory group modifies it based on the activities. Pontine respiratory centers, they communicate with the uh, medulla respiratory centers and establish breathing patterns and things like vocalizing or speaking. Three chemical factors that are most important in regulation of respiratory activity are uh, concentration of CO2, pH, and oxygen concentration sensed by chemoreceptors. So hypercapnia. Hypercapnia is elevated CO2. It increases respiratory rate and depth. Decreased pH increase respiratory rate and depth. So as we mentioned before, in hyperventilation, blood CO2 goes down, blood pH goes up. That leads to the constriction of the cerebral vasculature and the person can pass out. Before we move on, any questions? No, we're good? Okay. Oxygen pressure in the blood. So it, when oxygen pressure in the blood drops, rate 
and depth of breathing go up. But slight changes in the oxygen pressure in the blood do not have a much influence because you have a pretty good venous reserve. You have a pretty good depot of oxygen bound to hemoglobin. Hypothalamus provides the regulation um, of respiratory activities associated with emotional responses like elevated breathing rate when you have sympathetic activation. You can control breathing voluntarily to a certain point because when CO2 concentration in the uh, blood goes way up, that invokes a reflex, a normal reflex. So think of it as a reflex arch. So CO2 goes up sensed by chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptors send the signal to medulla oblongata. Why it's O2, I don't know, forget about two. Medulla oblongata sends the output to respiratory muscles and respiratory muscles increase breathing rate and depth. Okay, so that's your reflex here. Okay. Irritant reflex. Sorry, I have like okay, there. Irritant reflex when something um, is sensed by mechanoreceptors, you cough and sneeze. Three main factors that increase respiratory rate during exercise. Um, Motor cortices communicate with the muscles. They're more neural than metabolic. So motor cortices um, stimuli from the from the frontal lobe. Your expectation of uh, moving increases the respiratory rate. So those are neural factors. Um, muscles switch to fermentation during exercise, not because there's not enough oxygen, but because there's not enough blood flow. It's not respiratory insufficiency. It's insufficiency in the blood flow. <clears throat> sudden exposure to high altitudes. So when oxygen suddenly drops, the blood flow to the brain and blood flow to the lungs increase. Blood flow to the brain to deliver enough oxygen for neurons. Blood flow to the lungs to properly oxygenate blood. Uh, increased blood flow to any organ can lead to the edema. In this case, pulmonary edema and <coughs> Sorry, cerebral edema. So acclimatization to high altitude. First, minute ventilation goes up. Red blood cells go up. So short-term, minute ventilation. That happens almost immediately. Long-term, increased production of erythropoietin as a, and as a consequence, increased number of red blood cells. Chronic bronchitis. <coughs> obstructive accumulation of um, mucus in the conducting zone, treatment options, bronchodilators, mucolytics, uh, oxygen. Emphysema is actually both obstructive and restrictive, but mostly restrictive disease. Asthma is obstructive disease. A main mechanism, yeah, allergy, allergic reaction leads to the constriction of the respiratory passages. Cystic fibrosis, you have a deficient dysfunctional chloride channel, uh, which leads to the accumulation of mucus. And mucus-laden conducting zone cannot increases the resistance to the airflow. Uh, so all those mucus covered ducts become obstructed. Um, that leads to much higher rate of bacterial infections, pneumonia, so on and so forth. That's why antibiotics are necessary. Treatments, again, vasodilators, inhalations of the saline. Um, I forgot it, like chest auscultation to loosen the mucus. Tuberculosis, bacterial infection of the lung, symptoms, shortness of breath, low-grade fever, greenish or bloody sputum, uh, night sweats. Treatment options, antibiotics. So lung cancer most common cause of cancer in the United States. Main underlying cause is smoking. Treatment options, 
There are some drugs. Chemo prognosis is better when lung cancer is diagnosed earlier. Fetal lung is inactive. It's filled with fluid. Gas exchange happens at the placenta. What decreases respiratory efficiency with age? Thoracic wall structure. Usually muscles become weak. Respiratory passages become narrower and laden with mucus. Alveolar size increases, which decreases the surface area. Lung elasticity goes down due to the fibrosis. So that concludes the part with the small questions now. Um, I've got you some pictures, list. If you have any questions, unmute yourself and ask. I'm going to quickly scroll down. Now, you can see these questions here. Um, it, try to write two, three sentences describing you know, like differences between pulmonary ventilation, internal and external expiration, gas transport, or try to write, like describe four respiratory volumes. Tidal volume is the volume that we normally inspire expire. Inspiratory reserve is the volume that we can inspire on top of tidal and so on and so forth. That will help you to structure your thoughts before getting into the exam and answering those essay questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions, it's time to ask them now. We're good? We're good? Okay. I'm going to stop recording then.